Today, I introduce you to the second part of this term. There's three pieces to this term. There's database design concepts. Good news is, we're done, sort of. Part two is SQL. In other words, you learn how to manually do the crap and how to communicate. Then there's, towards the end of the term, there's intermediate SQL. It's where you learn stuff that's going to make your brains hurt. Right now, this stuff, depending if you're practically minded as opposed to being theoretically minded, if you're practically minded, this is going to work for you. If you're theory minded, this might be painful. However, without further ado, what am I going to do today? I'm going to introduce you to SQL. I'm going to explain DDL, some basic SQL commands to get you started. And then we are going to move on to the announcements for the day. Okay, history lesson. And there is a history lesson when it comes to SQL. Now, SQL is a special purpose language. It means it's done to do one thing and do it well. Now, if you don't know what the difference is between a specialty purpose language and a general purpose language, let me allow it to clarify. A general purpose language is like C, Java, C Sharp, Visual Basic, PHP, Python. Those are general purpose languages. That means you can write all kinds of different programs in it and basically do anything you really need to do with a computer with it. That's general purpose. Specialty languages are languages that are designed with one thing in mind and only one thing. SQL was designed to talk to databases. That's what it does. Anybody here ever learn about statistics, study statistics at some point? Okay, there's a language called R. It's a programming language for statistics. All it knows how to do is stats. Everything you could ever want to do in stats, you could do in R. That's its purpose in life. Those are specialty purpose languages. Sort of like a language called Eiffel. Eiffel has a very specific language. It's a language designed to teach you students how to program. It was designed by university. It teaches the concepts of programming. It's totally useless outside of that, but it teaches those concepts well. So SQL is a, a targeted language that does one thing well. So originally it was created by IBM in the 1970s, really early 70s. Those of you that did the slideshow might, that the initial hybrid, hybrid one might know some of this. It's been around for a bit. Originally it was called SQL, Structured English Query Language. Thus, the idiotic pronunciation that people call it SQL, because it started out as being called SQL. However, IBM was taken to court because somebody else had a product called SQL. IBM was a big fat target. Back then, IBM didn't like lawsuits. It said, whatever, we'll just get rid of all the vowels. And they called it SQL. Now, this is where I voice one of my pet peeves all the time. Because I'll hear people say SQL. It's not SQL, it's SQL. It's an initialism, not an acronym. An acronym you pronounce, an initialism you say the letters, like IBM. It's not IBM. Right? It's not SQL, it's SQL, Structured Query Language. There you have it. The first commercial version of SQL, and I almost said SQL because I was ranting about it, is was Oracle version 2 for VAX. This is going back just a few years. VAXs were computers that are about three times the size of this desk. They had a whopping 200K of RAM. And most schools ran on it. A lot of industries ran on it. Those of us that are old enough remember a big company here in Ottawa that had campuses all over the place called Digital. That was a, one of Digital's babies. After a while, the ISO standard and the ANSI group both got together and said, we need to establish a standard. So SQL 86 was created. It set down the ground rules of what SQL should contain. Then, as the years went along, they released more and more standards. SQL 99 included regex. The M supposed to be a comma. 
recursion and triggers. That's when that stuff was made standard. In 2003, 2008, because that's when the heyday of XML was around, they everybody threw in ideas of XML into the standard. In 2008, they added some extra functionality to triggers, which is what instead of is. And they introduced truncate. Truncate had been around for years. It's just they decided to add it to the standard at that point. I covered truncate later in the term. Currently, we're sitting at SQL 2011. They're arguing over the next standard. Just so you know, most database manufacturers, the ones that make the software, pride themselves at being SQL 99 compliant. And most of them are almost 99 compliant. So what happens every time a standard comes out, the, develop, the database developers look at them, they go, oh, that's a cool feature, that's a cool feature, that's a cool feature, nobody ever asked for these. So we're not going to bother implementing them. Then they'll go, oh, but Oracle's got that. That's not worth our time. So they go through and they cherry pick the standards and they establish parts of the standard. Postgres is actually about 90% SQL 2008 compatible. It's actually the, currently the most up-to-date database engine you can use. So the one you've got all installed on your laptops is the most up-to-date engine you can use at the moment. Microsoft SQL Server is close behind. Oracle is doing whatever Oracle does because it's Oracle. Um, and the other ones are a varying level of whatever. And MySQL says, I'm the special child. I'll grab some of this, 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 and this. I can ignore entire parts that are actually important because that's MySQL. Okay. The SQL language. It's a three-part language. It's kind of weird because at some point in time, I'm pretty sure a bunch of pocket protectors over at IBM sat there, everybody in a different room, and didn't communicate with each other. And they each took a different part of the language and designed it. So imagine if I took nine of you, put you each in a different room, and said, you must communicate with a database using an English language. Your task is insert data, select data, update data, and you're going to create a table. But you don't communicate amongst each other. That's what the language is like. So basically put, it's a very straightforward language, except no two things look the same. In a way, it's a good thing because you definitely know what you're doing is wrong because it doesn't look right. By the same token, the syntax is weird because of this. But that's okay, such is life. So it's made up of three pieces. This course touches on the first two. The third is not for this course. The first part is the DDL, the Data Definition Language. Its purpose is to create and maintain objects. So if you can think of a database diagram as being a blueprint for a house, the DDL are the guys that actually assemble your house for you. They put together the house. And if anybody here has ever built their own house, as in you built a custom house somewhere, you realize you constantly have to walk in and make changes because the guys aren't following the blueprints or the blueprint prints are wrong. <laughs> the DDL is the construction crew, the make the carpenters, the electricians, the plumbers. That's its purpose in life, is to build the structure of the database. It has nothing to do with the data inside of it. There's the DML, the data manipulation language. Its purpose is to create and maintain the actual content of the data. So this is what fills in the rooms of your house. If you want to add people, you can add people. If you want to take people out, you can take people out. You can change people. Today, you're a pink unicorn. Congratulations. You can make whatever you want. Then there's the DCL, the data control language. That's the part of the language that determines who can basically walk into your house and look around. What's kind of cool with it is it allows all kinds of security. Not only can you say, you are allowed in my house, or no, you're not allowed in my house. You can say, you're not allowed in this room. But you can go everywhere else in the house. Or you're allowed to come into this room, but you're not allowed to look at the couch. So there's that much security. You can tie it down to the point where you can uniquely identify specific things in the database that people aren't allowed to see. Um, or you can say, set rules of what they are allowed to do, not just what they're allowed to look at. You can say, yes, you can go into the bathroom. Yes, you can look at the toilet. No, you don't get to use it. Congratulations. Or even better. You're allowed to go into the bathroom, 
and put something in there, but you're not actually allowed to look at what you did. Just putting it out there. So that's what the DCL does. We're not touching that. That's part of a database administration course. So if you end up taking a database administration course, this is where you're going to learn about this. The language is case insensitive. It's the language itself is case insensitive. That means SQL keywords can be uppercase, lowercase, mixed case. It doesn't care. Object names and the data is usually case sensitive. And I say usually uh, because depending on the database server, the rules change. MySQL is case insensitive no matter what you do. It's, its engine is too stupid to actually differentiate. Oracle is also case insensitive because it lies. It stores all the database objects in uppercase inside the system catalog. So you could type in a, an object name and change the case three times, it's not going to care. That's how it behaves. Microsoft SQL Server is sometimes case sensitive depending on what operating system, uh, not what operating system, but what language you've installed it on. If you install it on a Cyrillic server, it's case insensitive because, well, the Cyrillic alphabet really doesn't have uppercase, lowercase. If you install it on a Latinx server, it may be case sensitive depending on what options you turn on. Postgres, on the other hand, is annually retentive case sensitive. It cares lots. It's about a bit like that significant other that doesn't like it when you leave your shoes in the middle in front of the door because you really care about where those shoes belong. That's how case sensitive it is. So that being said, when people type in the SQL language, often what they'll do out of habit is type in all the keywords uppercase. And since most of the object names, especially if you follow the rules I gave you, are going to be lowercase, it makes it really easy to identify what is a keyword as opposed to an object, right? Capital select, lowercase name, capital from, lowercase customer. Looking at it visually right away, you know what's the keyword and what's not. Now, the problem is that there's sometimes keywords that overlap with object names, but you know, just as the word name, go figure. Um, but case sensitivity is, that's how it works. Spaces are used as keyword delimiters. Remember when I talked about how you can't put spaces in your object names? Well, you can, but you've got to trick the database server into allowing it. Therefore, the rule is just don't bother. You have to trick the server. But by the same token, it uses spaces as delimiters. Unlike Java, where you can go for bracket dot i, no dollar sign, wrong language, i equals zero, semicolon, I less than 10, semicolon, I plus plus, close bracket, curly, whatever the heck it is, print 10, close curly. In there, there's one space between the print and the number. With SQL, every single word has to be separated. So you can't do a run on command because it won't know what the hell you're talking about. The command terminator is good news for you guys. It's a semicolon. Congratulations. Yay. So you guys have got used to throwing on semicolons at the end of each of your lines of Java. At the end of every command of SQL resides a semicolon. However, there is one exception to the rule. If you're only issuing one SQL command, you don't need the semicolon. So I go, select star from customers, run. I don't need the semicolon because it's the last thing. If you're going to go select name from customer, semicolon, delete customer, that's two commands, you need the semicolon. So that's the rule of semicolons. So I'm going to go into talking about the DDL today, because essentially that is the important part for the first bit, because that's what you guys are going to need for lap six. DDL is made up of three commands. There's a command called create, there's a command called alter, there's a command called drop. Use create to make stuff up, use alter to change that story, and you drop it when you don't want to talk about it anymore. That's why I use those words. So, those are the three keywords. I don't teach the entirety of each command. 
and there's a reason for this. The and, I, and on the slideshow, so if you download the slideshow, you'll see there's links at the bottom of the next couple of slides. I linked to the documentation from Postgres, since that's what you're using. For example, the create table command, the syntax reference, if I were to print it on a piece of paper, would take about 14 pages of everything you can do with the create table command. Just putting it out there. However, this is the basics, and this will work for you 90% of the time. The create command is used when you're creating a database object. The syntax is fairly straightforward. You create, in other words, create, space. What are you creating? Now, this is where, you know, the type of object is substituted. Are you creating a table? Are you creating a view? Are you creating a function? Are you creating a data type? Are you creating a trigger? So you, what do you create? Create space table, because right now we're worrying about tables. Then you give it a name, because in the database, things cannot exist unless they have a name. So you create table, space, for example, test, and then you put in the definition of the table. Now, depending on what is being created, the create syntax will fluctuate. However, this one shows you how to create a table. Later in the term, I'll show you how to create functions and triggers and views. To create a table, there's two methods. Right now, I'm teaching you the first because this is the most common one you're going to end up using. And it's as follows. Create table test. Open up a bracket. Inside of there, you enlist the fields, also known as attributes. And basically, the syntax goes, name of the field, the data type of the field, and any modifiers for the field. So create table test, open the bracket. Of course, my primary key is called ID. So it's ID space, and I've told you guys to use big serial. ID space big serial, and since it's the primary key, we put on the primary key keyword. So create table test, ID big serial primary key comma. That means I'm going to add another field. Name, varkar 50 not null. Anybody want to take a guess what that means? Okay, it cannot be empty. That was almost a rhetorical question. <laughs> but essentially you're creating a field called name. That is a 50 character long string that cannot be empty. And then I've got active, which is a Boolean, which is also not null. And I'm giving it a default of true. If you make a Boolean not null, you have to tell it what its default value is. Because as I explained last week, two weeks ago, when I was talking about the data types, Booleans in database servers, well, at least database servers that support true Booleans, have three states, yes, no, and I don't know. When you set it not null, that means you're not allowed to not know. Therefore, you give it a default value. Can you imagine if you could apply the not null default value to your entire life? Those who have significant others that go, what would you like for supper tonight? I don't know. You pick something. Default McDonald's. <laughs> Just use putting that out there, you know. What? But that's exactly how that goes. But imagine if you could do that. That always, always gets a good rise because it, I'm making a point. It works really, really well. Right? So, yes, no, and there's no I don't know. So that's what this is saying. As I've got a link here, you can go look at the create table syntax. It goes on forever. Alter. You use it to change the definition of an object. When you're working with a table, you can rename the table, you can add columns, remove columns, rename them, <coughs> change their data type, set their default, determine if they're not null or not. In other words, you can change everything about the table pretty much. There's a few items you can't touch, but that's pretty rare. Again, the syntax varies by object because it's the SQL language. So, for example, you decide you need to go change your name. If you want to do that in Canada, you go fill out a couple of forms, pay up a couple hundred bucks, and congratulations, your name is Unicorn. 
On the other hand, in the database server, you go alter table, whatever it's called, test, alter column, give it the column name, give it the new name, done. Now, depending on the database server, the part after alter table changes. In Postgres, it would be alter table, test, rename name to other name. In MySQL, it's alter table, test, alter column, first the old name and the new name, semicolon. It's just the syntax is different. So that's why I don't teach a lot of the syntax because you end up having to look it up. I'll be doing some demos when we come back because obviously after you hear the announcements, you'll understand why I need to go back to this. And again, feel free to look up at the syntax for alter table. It's also going to be as long as your arm. The drop command is the easiest command to remember. It's pretty much the same, same syntax for everything. And depending on the, but the only problem is here is the database from one server to the other, this mod changes a little bit. Some of them is just drop whatever the object is called. Other ones you have to tell drop table test. And I didn't link to the drop command because the page on drop is like that long. It's drop, and the, the general syntax is drop object type name semicolon. There is a cascading functionality. So if there's a child table that's a parent child relationship between two tables, and if you need the parent, guess what happens to the child? The whole family gets wiped out. So, but by the rule, by general, those rules don't apply because then you have to turn them on and hard code it in. So that's the drop table command. Now the DML. Believe it or not, we're on slide 9 of 13 already. DML is made up of four sort of five commands. And that's why I say sort of five, because the fifth one's a little weird. There's insert, if you want to add data. In other words, you want to take some information and shove it into the table. Update, you want to change that data. So the data, your name went from being Sarah to Fluffy Unicorn. Hopefully there's no Sarah in the room. There probably is. There always is. Delete, you want to get rid of the data. And then there's truncate. Now, truncate is kind of special, which is the fifth. It's sort of like what delete does, except it's like comparing a pellet gun to a Gatling gun. Delete, you say delete from table, and you don't give it criteria. It'll delete every row in the table. What it'll do is it'll go row one, delete, row two, delete, row three, delete. If you have a million rows, it's going to take a while. It's going to go one, two, three, up to a million rows. There's always a chance of a failure. There's always a chance of a crash. And then there's truncate. What truncate does is it reads the table definition and then sets it, everything to zero after that instantly. There is no recovery from truncate. There is no, whoops, I done screwed up. Um, truncating a million row table takes about, from my experience, about a thousandth of a second. All it does is, it's a bit like when you delete a big file in Windows. Did you ever notice you can delete a four gig file as fast as you can delete a 1K file, and you know how it does that? It marks that space as available and empty. That's what Truncate does. It says, see all this stuff here? Pretend it's not here and just feel free to overwrite it all. It doesn't exist. Now, the reason why this one's a little different, depending on what server it's running on, the Truncate command does different things. On Postgres, it nukes the contents of the table, done. On MySQL, it also resets the auto increment. So suddenly, you might have had a million rows and your next primary key was a one million and one. Now, after truncate, it's one. That's the difference between Postgres and MySQL. Not a lot of them behave like MySQL. Microsoft SQL Server does, Oracle does not, IBM's DB2 does not. Before you play with truncate, 
I strongly recommend you read what it's going to do to you. And you can also do a truncate cascade, which means it empties out this table and at the same time empties out all the children below it. Yes? No. They're doing essentially the same thing. Except one does it one thing at a time. So if I were to use that example of this room and I start deleting, I go, you're deleted, get out. Okay, let's just go. You're deleted, get out. You're deleted, get out. Now I turn around and go, I'm going to truncate this room. You all disappear instantly. There's no one in this room. You were not even here. You never existed. I've erased you from existence. Woohoo! Someone's on vacation. Mute. That's the difference between delete and truncate. Delete affects one item at a time for all the ones that are going to be affected. Truncate affects everything regardless. There is no criteria. I can't say I'm going to delete everybody who's wearing a hat right now. Right? So that would delete one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You don't count. Thirteen with varsity. So I'm just, you know, if I delete everyone who has a hat, I deleted 13 people. If I say truncate this room, I don't care if you've got a hat or not. You're gone. So that's the difference. Truncate's really, really dangerous. It's not a command you use on a regular basis, but it exists. And what's the repeating pattern here if I said every command has a different syntax? The select statement does not look like the insert statement, the delete doesn't look like. It sort of looks like the select. The update sort of looks like the select, but not quite. The insert looks like nothing else. Now I'm going to give you an example for the insert. So the insert command was created to add data into a database. And I teach you the classic syntax for the insert statement. Somewhere along the way, the guys at MySQL thought it would be a fantastic idea to copy the insert state, the insert syntax to the update syntax, so that the update and the insert behave exactly the same, except nobody else but them does it. So what's the point of teaching you that? If I'm going to teach you the, st the classic statement, and the syntax is insert into, give it a table name. Don't put in the angle, the angle brackets. They're less than, greater than. I'm just using this to denote where you'd substitute stuff. Round brackets, the list of columns. Then values, another set of round brackets, the list of values that map out to the columns. For example, insert into test. We're going to insert into test, name and active. So we're going to put two values into the test table. Which, if you remember right, actually has three columns, ID, name, and active. However, ID is set to auto increment because it's a big serial. You don't, it has a default value. You don't need to include it for the ride. So we're going to insert into name and active. We're in, and then the values are going to be woohoo and true. Woo. Now, here's a few caveats. Everything is comma separated. As you can see, there's a comma between name and active between woohoo and true. That comma separates the values and the columns. You have to have the same number of val values as you have columns. If you're telling if you're telling the database server, I'm going to put in two values into, well, I'm going to insert values into two columns, you have to give it two values. You can't give it one because you told it there's going to be two. You can't give it three because you told it there's going to be two. It's picky and anal retentive that way. Right? It's like you say you're going to do something, and then you don't do it, you get in shit. If you say you're going to do something, and you do too much of it, you also get in shit. Therefore, you do exactly what you said you're going to do, no more, no less. I have included the syntax. Link to the syntax of the insert statement. 
it's pretty comprehensive. But it's not too bad. There is a different version of the insert statement, which I teach later. And it's used to create materialized views. There's the update statement. Use it to change the contents of a row of data. Update, the name of the table, set, then you do a key value pair, where, and then you give it some conditions. I have, I'll be teaching you guys the where stuff later. However, update test, set name equal to working, where ID is one. If I were to use the create syntax I had in the previous, like three, four slides ago, and then I did the insert statement from the previous slide, the primary keys I value would be, for the first row, would be one. Because it's the first row going in. That's where the ID equals one bit comes in. Update test set name equal to working. So that's saying I want to change the contents of test. I'm going to set the value of name to be equal to working where the ID is equal to one. So in the first row, we're going to change the value of name away from woohoo, change it to working. And it just happens. If you need to update more than one column, you go, for example, name equals working, comma, active equals false. You separate using commas each of the columns you want to update inside that row. You can update one row, ten rows, all the rows. That's what the where clause does. It says which ones do I want to modify. I'll be you guys are going to be learning all kinds all kinds of stuff about where when you come back after Thanksgiving. However, if you don't include a WHERE clause, it's going to affect everything. Everything gets it. Top to bottom, left to right, no questions asked. It's as if I suddenly said, everybody in here is a unicorn. And I don't differentiate amongst any of you. So you're all fluffy unicorns now. Congratulations. If you don't specify who's a unicorn, then that's bad. Because you can modify people that don't want to be modified. And this leads me to the warning. And I give this warning pretty much at this point every time I do this lecture. Database servers, with the exception of Oracle, and it's a pain in the ass to achieve this, even in Oracle, do not have undo. It's immediate. For example, we all have that friend. You could say, go get me a carton of milk. It's 3 a.m. and all the stores are closed. They'll still go out and try to get a carton of milk instantly. And they're gone. They don't have a cell phone because they're idiots. Right? You can't recall him to tell him, don't get this phone. Don't get it now. It's instant. It's a bit like spilling a cup of coffee into your Mac. It's instantly dead, never to be seen again. But you got picked on this time. This is the best story I've had in years. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, it's instant. It's over. Kaput. It's a bit like throwing your phone under the bus and the bus runs over your phone. It's not coming back. So that means if I were to run this command, I can't go control Z. Because it's instant. There is no coming back from it. There is no recovery. Delete. It's used to get rid of data. Delete from table name where conditions. Again. The where, I've explained fairly well what that does. So I don't need to explain that a second time. So delete from table name. Delete from classroom. You're all gone. Congratulations. It's that simple. The syntax is actually fairly short. It's funny. It's lots of work to create stuff. It's not a lot of work to get rid of it. You know? It takes a long time to build a house. All it takes is an idiot with a match to burn it down. A lot less work to burn it down than it is to make it. Same thing with the database. It's a much easier to destroy the data than it is to actually maintain it. And with every syntax thing I've done, I've included 
the link to the slide, to the instructions. The next command I'm going to talk about is the most basic command for SQL, and then I'm done talking about the introduction to SQL. The select command. Select command is to grab information out of a table. It has an insane amount of syntax. As in, I'm going to spend almost two classes dedicated to the syntax. 95% of the work you do in a database has to do with the select command. Insert and update. Once you've figured out what the first command is and you embed it in your Java application or your PHP application, you never need to touch it again. On the other hand, you spend an awful lot of time pulling crap out of the database. Today I'm covering the very most basic syntax. This is the database equivalent to hello world. Select star from table. In other words, select star from test. It's telling it, give me all the information from test. Give it all to me. So when you guys are doing lab six and you start creating tables and inserting values and you want to make sure it went in, you go select star from whatever table you're playing with and it'll show you what's inside of it. This is the equivalent of ripping the front off your house. Everybody, look what I've got inside. Knock yourselves out. Yeah, sort of. No, it's not. But I, I tried. I really tried to give it to you, but I, I'm not. Now, this is the most basic syntax. It's very straightforward. It's very English. Star means everything. So select star from test. Select everything from test. It's English. It's readable. If English is not your first language or French is not your first language and you've learned English, the syntax might be a little rough. However, it's very English. So as long as you can write an English sentence and understand an English sentence, you should be okay. Because most commands in SQL, especially when you're dealing with the select side of the deal, you can read it like a sentence. And if it makes sense, it'll do exactly what you wrote. Not necessarily what you want it to do, but it'll do exactly what you wrote. Okay. So that's the introduction side to SQL. At this point in time, in everybody's term, things start happening. And what is happening for you guys today? And that didn't work. Damn it, it worked so much better last time. There we go. Joy, assignment one has shown up to the party. Now, the course outline states you must have at least one group assignment. Guess which one it is? It's assignment one. Get it over with. I hate them as much as you do. Why? For me, they're great. That means I've got, you know, 30, 40 to 50% less assignments to grade because I'm grading three people at a time. It sucks for me because I got the damn politics of I don't like my group. Cloud phone's an asshole. You know, he's not paying attention. Best part. <laughs> Anyways, that was even better. Um, but that being said, there's politics involved with group work. And one of the reasons why you get thrown so much group work at you guys in your first term is to actually learn to work with other people. I, we've all had the experience in high school. This is a group project, and everybody goes, oh, no. I know you have to work with that person. Okay, so the way this is going to work, it's groups of three. I'll take groups of two. If you have a really good reason, I'll do a group of one. No, there's, there's cases, like I've got a case where one fellow is leaving, is leaving the country for two weeks. There's no way he can group with, work with another group of people. Two, you suffer from crippling social anxiety. I, I know it sounds mean when I'm saying that, but there's been cases of that too where you cannot work with other people. It's life. 
but you need to prove to me why you can't work as part of a group because you're being evaluated and your ability to coordinate your work as a group. Okay? Now, in a minute, I'll show you guys how to create your own groups. I once tried creating groups, and that worked like as well as a lead balloon. It doesn't work. It's like putting diesel gas in a car that's not made for diesel. It doesn't go very far for very long. It just doesn't work. So in a minute, I'll show you guys how to create your groups. It's not hard. You can even set the limit. So if you just so happen to know that you only want to work with one other person, you can set your group to only allow two people in. And Basically, the way it works is one of you creates the group, the other one joins it. Uh, the group tools are pretty fantastic. You have your own wiki. You can upload and share files through it. There's a discussion board. So if you really don't want to talk to them or their cloud phone's broken, you can talk to them via the message board. Right? So there's all kinds of tools. It's, it's, it's like a miniature blackboard for your group. It's actually pretty cool. It's got lots of good stuff. Now, what is this project that you're getting? There is an invoice that you're given, which is attached to this assignment. As you can see, there's five files. There is an invoice. There is two sample documents, samples. One, well, three, but the customer sample and the product sample, that shows you examples of what the data may look like. So you're dealing, you're getting an idea of what it looks like on the inside. There is a database design document. This looks very much like when I was in school, they called a data dictionary. When we did database design in school, we used to have these books, these reams of paper. And in these reams of paper, we had to keep track of everything we did for that project. It included, you know, I'm going to define this table. And there was actually a page for each table you defined, including what is the name of the table? What's each of the fields? What's the data type of that field? Is it related to another table? And you actually wrote it all out. I'm making you guys do the same thing I did. <laughs> Torture. There is uh, a PDF also, which is the invoice. And the sample, the sample one dot doc X is a sample filled in database design document. It shows you what is supposed to be in there and what it should roughly look like. Now, you will be submitting three diagrams and the database design document. There's a conceptual, logical, and a physical diagram. If you don't know what those are, watch last week's lecture. I did it all on the board. I literally did last week, this week's this assignment on the board in 45 minutes. Almost. Except for the documentation part of it. You can export PNG out of ERD plus, and actually it says Vertebello, that should say Toad, because I say Toad down here. Uh, my, this is the same assignment my summer students had, and I had them use a different tool. But I'll update it so it says Toad, so there's no confusion. Um, making sure you sign up for a group, even if you're a group of one. Why? You will not be able to submit the assignment. Blackboard's funny that way. I say this assignment is a group assignment. If you're not in a group, you can't submit because you can't see the submission box. I can't grade you because you didn't submit anything. And I can't grade you because it's going to have a nice little grayed out box or I can't type anything in because you didn't submit anything, because you didn't participate as a group, even if it's a group of one. Now, what are you going to do? You're going to take the documents I gave you and break them down. So there's an invoice and the two samples. You're going to look through them. You're going to do some analysis. You're going to determine the bits and pieces. You will create the conceptual diagram, which you'll convert to a logical diagram. And then based on the conceptual diagram and the logical diagram, you're going to create a physical diagram using Toad. It's kind of strange, you know, kind of like lab three and lab five and lab two. Sounds familiar. This is not work you haven't done unless you haven't done those labs. And then you're going to take that crap, shove it inside the document that you properly filled out. And I use that document as your checksum. 
In other words, I look at your diagrams and I'm going, why the hell did they name this shit this way? And I look at your document and I go, oh, they were stupid enough to call it that there too. Good enough, they followed through with the documentation, you don't lose any points. Documentation is your CYA, it covers your assets. By assets, I mean assets of the ETS. And in the world of development, documentation is king. Whatever is written down is the rule. Therefore, if you do something stupid, but you wrote down saying you're going to do something stupid, good enough. How's the grading? Okay. It's broken down in several chunks. The conceptual ERD is worth five points. By the way, it's a grand total of 30 points in case you are unable to actually read that. 30 points total. Conceptual is five points. In other words, does it show all the important entities? And does it show all the connections between them? Do you notice I'm not telling you how many entities there are? And just because it's five points doesn't mean it's five points and that means there's five entities. It just means I got five points and I'm going to start taking off partial points for depending on what you screwed up. The logical ERD, does it show all the important entities? Does it show all the connections? Does it sound familiar to the first part? Because you're going from the first part to the second part. But this time, is it showing all the important attributes? In other words, is everything there that should be there? Then it gets down to the physical ERD. 15 points, that's where the meat of the assignment resides. Does it have all the details listed in the database design document? Five points. In other words, I'm going to look at your physical ERD and flip to your document and say, oh, look, table blah has four attributes in the document. Table blah in the diagram has three, minus one. And I'll take up to five mistakes off. Naming conventions being followed. Five points, minus one for every mistake. I gave you guys what the naming conventions are last week. I've also copied them down here for you guys, so you can't say, well, I don't have them in writing. They're right on the assignment. This is a five free points. I guarantee 20% of this class will lose those five points. If you guys, is less than 20% of this class loses all five points, or at least part of the five points, I'll be shocked. Because historically, that's what the number is. It's about a fifth of the class doesn't listen. Are the relationships defined properly? Five points, as in, is the Parent child actually going in the right direction? Is that the one to many? Is the crow's foot pointing at the right tables? Again, five points. I mean, if you guys make mistakes, I take off a couple of points as applicable. Then there's the fuzzy part. This is five, the last five points. Did you cover all the basics? In other words, did you actually catch everything you're supposed to catch? Is your database designed properly normalized? As in, did you actually break down the database to its smallest component pieces or not? I've had this assignment given back to me with two tables in it. This was zero. I can guarantee you there's no way to do this in two, three, or four tables. There's no way. Naming conventions are listed here. Same ones last week. I am not going to repeat them. Read them. Understand them. If you don't understand what that means, come and see me. Okay. Now, for you guys, if you want to create your groups, you go under Student Tools, and mine looks a little different than yours, you go to Group. And you guys go Create. Well, you guys only have one Create button, not a bunch of buttons, but you go Create. And you give it a name. And I recommend, please name it after who's in your group. Last names, first names, I don't care. But if I get Team Alpha, best group, anything, I'll be really pissed. Because sometimes it's totally useless for me to know the cute name you give yourself. If suddenly it says, oh yeah, I can't, I'm having problems, I can't access my group, what's it called? Waldo. No, really, I had a group called themselves Waldo once. And then you can see all the stuff you can turn on for yourself. 
Okay, you give it a name, it's the Stein up sheet right here. Three. Or two. Or if you're a loner. No. No. Pretty soon you're going to be working by yourself. Now, that's how you create the group. Once you've created it, you won't see the assignment right away. But you'll still see the assignment in the sense of here. Because what I did do is I put up the instructions separately. So you're still able to see this and work on it. Because you can't see the top one until you've joined a group. It's just how it is. But I made sure you guys are able to see it before. Group of three, dude. Three. And so that's that. Now, here's the other things you need to know about this. You have two weeks. Okay? Two weeks. And then after two weeks, there is a one-week week grace period where you automatically get that 10% off. So if you decide you can't finish this in two weeks, don't even say a word to me. Just don't submit it. And then you can submit after that, and you get 10% off the top. Unless you have a real good reason, and I want photographic evidence for the real reason, and I've had really good reasons over the years, you have one additional week to finish it. At the end of that extra week, the assignment submission disappears. You automatically get zero. Unless you had a really good reason. I've had cases where somebody sent me a selfie because they were in the hospital with a broken leg. It was the nastiest thing I'd ever seen. Like they took a picture of themselves and their leg and the nurse working on their leg. It was fabulous. I had another person send me a picture from an airport in India saying, and you could see him, the plane, and a monsoon outside. I'm like, damn. How's the Wi-Fi? <laughs> no Wi-Fi. Trees are doing this, and the planes are sliding down the runway. You know. Okay, those are good, valid excuses. I caught the flu, and I spent the last five days on a shitter. Maybe I can buy that, but you can get a laptop tray. I'm just saying. You know, there are good excuses. Sometimes they're not good. I don't want the picture from the bathroom. Just putting it out there. But if you cannot achieve it and you need an extension, don't tell me five minutes before midnight. Odds are, if you're not done five minutes before midnight, you weren't going to be done at midnight anyways. You're probably going to know that day that something's gone horribly wrong. And since you're working as a group, and you're incapacitated because you wrapped your car around a tree because you're doing 220 in a 60 zone. Your team, your teammates can submit it on your behalf, which is why the group side of this works. You can upload the assignment as a file to the group as you're working on it, and somebody else can submit it for you. The other part is the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? One of you submits it. Not all three, one. When the group submits it, there's a link at the bottom of the group. Once you've been given access to the assignment, which I have to do, right? As you create your groups, I'll add you to the assignment. You'll see a box at the bottom, assignment submission, and you submit your assignment in there. Only one of you needs to do it. So make sure it's the one that's reliable that does it. So that's the assignment. I'm just one of those jackasses. I give you both at the same time. Test one. And as you can see, what time is it? In exactly one hour from now, you'll be able to see test one. Test one is a take home test. I don't do the whole, hey, you can write this test in class and you get three tries. Don't ask. I have one of the other database props, that's how she chooses to run her tests. Her tests are nasty and brutal, but she gives you three tries and keeps the best grade of the three. On the other hand, I give you an entire week to do it. 
with your textbook, with the recordings from the lectures, with the slides, you get one try. It is also, if I remember, write 50 questions. You can think of this as your midterm. Now, people say, oh, Dan, you're just loading on so hard right now. Okay. Realistically, I could sit down and do the assignment in 15 minutes. That's me because I've been doing it for a living. I expect, on average, historically, the assignment takes about three hours. Three hours is three of you. Okay? And if one of you sucks at diagramming, that's okay. What do you do? You get the two that can diagram, the third person the quality assurance. The person double checks everything and makes sure everything is good. Right? That's fair. So therefore, I'm giving you two weeks to do a three-hour assignment, roughly three to five hours, which is actually not that bad. You have a week to do a test. Realistically, it should take about an hour to do. It's open book, like really. You do it. You answer the questions. The good news is it's randomly generated. That means if you sit down with someone to do the test, they're not going to have the same test as you. <laughs> The tech questions are going to be in a different order, so you can't sit there and peek the guy's screen next to you. You know. So, here comes the rest of the announcements, and the guy that just left didn't hear the last announcement because he thought everything important was said. Next week's lecture is a work period. What does that mean to you guys? It means if you're comfortable doing the work, don't show up. Don't take up desks for people that need help. I'll be here to provide assistance with the assignment, not with the test. Unless I really done fucked up on one of the questions, which I'm saying, you know, might, might have. That happens. It's a brand new test. I've never run this one before, so there may be a few mistakes in there. And I will correct them. That's that. The lab next week is also a work period. Okay, let's do the math. Three hours assignment, four hours of dedicated class time. So if you say you can't do a three-hour assignment in two weeks where I'm giving you an entire week of class time to work on it, and I'm assigning no homework, which you're supposed to do up to an hour to three hours of homework a week, I don't have enough fingers. In a week, you have a seven-hour block of time to do three hours worth of work, and I'm giving you two weeks to do it. Okay, that's why I'm saying there's no excuses for late. 